The new Aston Martin DBX has got a very tricky task on its hands. Why? Because it has to be an Aston Martin and represent everything that that stands for, while at the same time being quite unlike any Aston Martin that has gone before. It must not dilute the brand, yet it must also have a certain amount of mass appeal. It mustn't anger the DB5 owner, yet it must delight those who have never heard of David Brown. It needs to perform in a Vantage's natural habitat, but also perform in a shopping trolley's natural habitat. It must have pace and practicality, glamour and good luggage space. You get the picture. This is a tricky but vital car for Aston Martin, which is why they've put so much effort into it and developed a whole new platform. Today, we're finally going to find out if all that hard work has paid off. So does it go like an Aston Martin? Well, with 542 brake horsepower, 516 pounds foot of torque, not 60 dispatched in just over four seconds. So yes, it does go like an Aston Martin. Some, of course, will say that it goes like a Mercedes AMG because it's the German company's 4-litre twin-turbo V8 under the bonnet, albeit with a revised firing order to give a smoother delivery more befitting of this sort of car. But to be honest, I don't think I'm ever going to be disappointed to find that M177 engine under a bonnet. The only thing that's slightly disappointing from a drivetrain perspective is the 9-speed automatic gearbox, which is okay, but sometimes it's just not quite the smoothest especially on downshifts. The big, rather theatrical aluminium paddles are good though. Anyway, next up. Does it sound like an Aston Martin? Well, with this four litre turbocharged V8, you might worry that gas particulate filters might get in the way, but... This sounds absolutely fantastic. In fact, it's one of the very best things about this car, I think. If you're gonna have a non-hybrid, non-EV, old-school V8, it has to sound good. And this most certainly does. Does it look like an Aston Martin? Well, I think it depends on the angle you see it from. Sometimes it looks absolutely stunning. Sometimes I'm just not quite so sure. There are definite Aston Qs, but some people can't unsee a strong resemblance to a Ford Cougar. Others go, wow, isn't that gorgeous? I can imagine James Bond driving that. Attractiveness aside, what's certainly true is that it disguises its size very well. Despite being longer and wider than a Range Rover, it more often looks like it's the size of the much smaller Porsche Macan. It really is big though, so big that Aston had to seriously upscale the size of the badge on its nose. Of course there's the look of the interior too. The seats were developed from those in the DB11 and in fact much of the interior feels familiar. The seating position is good, not low exactly but you feel you sit in rather than on the car. The tech is last generation Mercedes which is a shame and I'm sure people will expect it to be a touchscreen in the centre, but it's not. I'm not sure I'd spec white in an SUV, but you can't fault the materials themselves, with things like the glass buttons and metal vents being befitting of a car this expensive. Cool to the touch because of the cold vents, but they, there is a quality in here which you don't get in other cars. Does it handle like an Aston Martin? Well, this is an interesting one. Because in a straight line, when you first get into this car, it really does feel like a 4x4. The suspension has a sort of relaxed nature to it, a really long-limbed, almost lugubrious nature. It makes you think that this really isn't going to handle like an Aston Martin at all. And then you turn into a corner, and the incredibly quick steering, 14 to 1, comes into play and the electric anti-roll system comes into play as well and for such a big car and it does feel like a big car in a straight line suddenly it just shrinks this hasn't got rear wheel steer like a lot of suvs have these days but 
neither does it actually feel like it needs it. There are various driving modes which you access from the two buttons here. Essentially it's up to increase the ride height and down to decrease the ride height via the air suspension. GT mode is the sort of standard mode and then you can come down into well, individual, you can obviously set up how you like, and then sport and then sport plus. The primary ride is actually very good in all of them. It obviously ties itself down a little more when you get into sport and sport plus. In GT mode, it's curious because as I say, it, it rides very well, it's incredibly comfortable, but it is quite sort of busy on the secondary ride. You feel the little bumps and it's almost as though they've decided because it's an Aston Martin, they want you to still feel the road beneath you. That longer limbed ride means it's more like a Range Rover in a straight line, but then has a whiff of an Alfa Stelvio Quadrifoglio in the corners. As well as the quick steering, which can actually have the ESP nibbling at the brakes quite easily, you can certainly feel the 48 volt anti-roll system working hard. The torque distribution is quite overt too. It is capable of going from a 4753 front rear split to sending almost 100% to the back, with the electronically controlled limited slip diff then apportioning it across that rear axle. And it does make it feel very rear wheel drive, much more so than other SUVs. For such a big car, it actually feels really quite light on its feet. So, by and large, Aston Martin has done a good job in the areas it moves well, namely performance, handling and design. But this Aston Martin is different. You see, it can't just survive on handling straight line pace, looks and sound. This has to work on a practical level, in the real world. It has to be child seat friendly, with easy access to the Isofix. Aston Martin will of course sell you a branded leather covered child seat if you wish. Even more than one of Aston's GT cars, the DBX has to provide comfort and practicality on a daily basis or a long journey. To this end, the engineers paid a lot of attention to NVH, right from the basics of the bespoke body structure through to employing something called aeroacoustic software to model a potential wind noise. The result is a very refined, cosseting and quiet experience, if you're only tickling the V8 of course. They've really thought about the, the practical side of this cabin, something which you wouldn't necessarily think about in a sports car. Lots of cubby holes for cups and bottles and things like that, There's big stowage under here. Love the area under here as well for keeping things out of the way. The DBX should appeal to the outdoorsy sort, so you've got to know if things like, well, a bicycle will fit in the rear. You can of course get a bicycle rack if you want, but that wouldn't be such a good demonstration of the DBX's boot space. Even with the seats up, it has 632 litres for luggage. Of course, some people like to tow their hobbies around behind them, and it's worth pointing out that the DBX can only tow up to 2,700 kilos, as opposed to the more usual 3,500 kilos. But, by and large, whatever fills your leisure time, Aston has gone to great lengths to have you covered. For example, if you like flinging yourself down mountains in winter, there's a snowpack complete with boot warmers. Or, if you have a fleet of Pomeranians that like to go on muddy walks, then you will want the pet pack, complete with portable washer for their dirty little paws. Oh, he's getting so angry about it. Now, for some useful everyday scenario context, I thought I'd show you what a DBX looks like in some narrow streets. Lost? Me? I've no idea what you mean. Of course, this sort of situation is only stressful if you're driving and is exactly why some like to be chauffeured to the shops in order to get the weekly supplies of custard creams and Tizer. Bringing me neatly onto my next topic. One area that Aston Martin really has excelled itself with the DBX and which is pretty important for certain markets is the space in the rear. It's got a wheelbase of over three meters and the legroom is, well, extraordinary really. I'm sitting behind myself as it were here and we've got this Lovely panoramic roof as well, it feels nice and airy. Definitely a selling point. This being an SUV, there is of course the small matter of its off-road ability. To be honest, it only has to not disgrace itself on a muddy field. But I have tried one on a limited off-road course and it performed perfectly well, going up steep slopes and down steep slopes, and through lots of mud and water. 
it would probably be rather fun on some fire roads. I'd go for the all-season tar option though, if you do want to off-road. Ultimately, I suspect that even people who despise SUVs will want this particular SUV to be a rampant success. Because, well, let's face it, Aston Martin probably needs the DBX to be a success if the company is going to survive. But the DBX can't rely on philanthropy alone for a bulging order book. Let's deal with the negatives first. What are the reasons you wouldn't buy one? Well, at £158,000 in the UK or $190,000 in the US, it's a lot of money. Some might also have been hoping for a hybrid powertrain. Equally, others will be delighted that it doesn't have such a thing. The panel gaps on this car would certainly put some people off, but I'm hoping the full production cars will be better. And then, what are the major selling points? Essentially, all the things that would attract you to a more conventional Aston Martin. The badge. The way it drives. For some people, the looks. For others, the performance. The sound. Certainly, that appeals to me. And there are some things you wouldn't usually associate with an Aston, like its serenity on the motorway. Then there's the space in the back, which I really do think is class leading. In short, I think Aston has produced a very credible SUV that will really appeal to some people. Which is good news for those of us that want to see more Vantages and Vanquishes in the future.